Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions you might have. If we are unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be speaking on proven ways to find your immigrant, immigrant ancestors. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona, at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 32 grandchildren. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about ways to find your immigrant ancestors. Uh, these are, as I call them, proven ways because they're the recommended uh, methods of discovering uh, how, how and where people came from. But before we get into too far into the subject, uh, we need to kind of get some definitions here of the question between immigration or emigration. Now, immigration refers to people coming into a country. So immigrants are those who came into the United States. An emigrant or an immigration refers to people leaving a country. So you really have two shots in a lot of cases at finding someone who moves from one country to another. Uh, in the first instance, there are records of people coming into the country, uh, more or less, let's call it. And uh, the same thing with people leaving the country. Many of the European countries that we're concerned about kept close uh, records of the emigrants, the people that were leaving their country. I don't know if they were afraid of them coming back or whatever, but they, they did manage to keep uh, rather extensive lists. Um, another thing that's important to understand is that uh, depending on the time period that these, uh, that these people traveled from one country to another, there may be more, uh, more or less uh, records available. That The big issue here is um, pre-colonial times, so the colonial era, and uh, then the uh, time after the United States, after the if the United States became a country. And then the final would be modern era uh, after the 18, around 1880s. Uh, the reason for this is that in the early days, no one really kept track of people crossing that, uh, the international borders into, the United, into what we now have as the United States, mainly for two reasons. One is those borders hadn't been surveyed and nobody knew where they were. And so you really didn't know if you were in Canada or the United States or in, America, or in the United States for a long time. And secondly, uh, they just simply didn't care. Uh, they were encouraging immigration and uh, they didn't have any reason to keep track of who came in. That doesn't mean there aren't any records. It just simply means that uh, the types of records and the time periods make a tremendous difference. Uh, generally, you move back to things called passenger lists and other things like that, other uh, types of records that were generated like that. Okay, so if we look here, uh, we have to realize that we're all immigrants. Um, even if uh, you're, you're a native or call yourself a Native American, uh, you really came from somewhere else. The, the records may not be available, but uh, we're all immigrants here in this on this continent, uh, according to to uh, scientific uh, writings uh, and uh, according to uh, our own records here. Um, so in order to understand how what we're kind of talking about in, the term, in these terms is we're really talking about the earliest immigrants that came from Europe. And we might uh, want to expand our idea of who these people were and who they actually, uh, where they actually came from. First of all, um, whether or not uh, you want to talk about the earliest immigrants depends on whether you speak English, Spanish, French, or Russian, <laughs> because in each of those countries, uh, those each of those uh, European countries, uh, 
provided uh, immigrants to America who at a different during different time periods and beginning at a different time in the past. Um, so if we talk about it from uh, the earliest standpoint, uh, we need to understand, of course, there were no permanent settlements here before 1492. Uh, the significance of that date, obviously, is that's when uh, Columbus came to America. Uh, whether you consider Columbus to be uh, the original European uh, uh, discoverer of America, or whether you think the Norse uh, people came down from Scandinavia and settled in uh, eastern United States, uh, none of those settlements were permanent and or persisted until the point when uh, the vast majority of, of English, of, excuse me, of European immigrants came to America. So we have kind of a beginning date here. And next we have um, to understand where and how, uh, are avail how many records are available of, of Native Americans. The earliest Native American records that we have in America date from around 1774. Um, those are the first ones that uh, kept track of individual uh, Native American individuals. And they usually begin on the East Coast, although there are records that began in the Southwest, uh, particularly of, of some of the Indians, uh, American or Native Americans who lived in the Southwest. Uh, when the Spanish came in from Mexico to settle uh, in uh, what's now Arizona, California, uh, New Mexico, te parts of Texas, and up into even Colorado and, and uh, some of the other places in the Southwest. And if we're talking about America in general, the first uh, European settlement in the Americas was Panama in 1510. Uh, so we can go back to records, uh, settlement immigration records, if you will, of people who came to America to live as early as 1510 if we go down into Central America. Um, now, if we're talking about just the United States, the earliest settlement was at San Miguel de Guadalupe in Georgia. That's somewhat disputed by people who live in Florida, but <laughs> basically there's uh, the question of, uh, of who, uh, who was first is uh, kind of accepted that it was, uh, there were some early Spanish settlements. Now, th now we'll talk a little bit about the, the idea of locating the immigrant. The first and most important rule is we don't jump across the ocean until we have some foundations in the country of arrival that tell us where this person lived. Um, the fact that your ancestor came from Germany or from Switzerland or from Norway or Sweden or England or wherever is not at all helpful, uh, particularly because of the reason that so many people have similar names. Uh, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish one immigrant from another. And another thing we'll get into in, a, in just a few minutes, and that is the fact that many immigrants anglicized or Americanized, Americanized their names, uh, changed their names to, uh, to a different name when they came to America. Um, this probably a good point uh, to bring up the, the issue of uh, what we call uh, non-voluntary immigrants. Uh, transported people. Uh, if any of you uh, have uh, sort of an idea of, of the people who founded uh, Australia, for example, uh, the Australians hold uh, the, the idea that their ancestors were transported or forcibly removed from England or whatever country and shipped to Australia as uh, a point of pride. Well, in the United States, we have exactly the opposite viewpoint. Uh, we seem to think that uh, there's something wrong if we find out that our ancestors were transported to America. But uh, it's hard to determine, but it, it's possible that as high as 40% of the people who came to America during colonial times were actually transported here against their will. Now, some of them came as indentured servants. An indentured servant is a person who makes a contract 
with uh, a person in the in the uh, country, like for example here in the United States, uh, if someone needed a servant or a farm worker or a uh, some kind of an artisan of some type, they would uh, make it known that they would pay their way to America on the uh, for the for the uh, transfer of a contract that would in would create an, a, a debt on the part of that person to stay and work for a period of years, uh, usually around seven or even longer, uh, depending on the, on the type of uh, employment and whatever. And there were some reciprocal obligations, but basically the person that arrived was a slave <laughs> until they <laughs> worked off their indenture. And so they, uh, at the end of the indenture period, uh, uh, it's kind of like uh, working for the company store. Uh, you may have, they may have owed more money to the to the uh, sponsor than they started with, and at the end of that time, they probably would have to continue their indenture, sort of in um, indefinitely. But what happened in a lot of cases with these people is that uh, they were transported to the United States because of whatever infraction. Uh, by the way, the, the, the causes for transportation could be anything from failure to pay taxes uh, to uh, the, the, the proverbial stealing a loaf of bread, uh, which is uh, something that really act that actually happened. Um, if you want an insight, interesting insight to this, so once again, going to Australia, there are lists of all of the uh, transported people and the crimes they, they committed. Uh, and in going through those lists of crimes, you do find things like stealing a loaf of bread or, or stealing a broom or uh, uh, things that you could actually just misplace. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you have people who are uh, transported for sedition, treason, murder, <laughs> all sorts of things. They were all thrown together, obviously. They had a jolly time as they came to across the ocean with... with uh, some that were uh, hardened criminals and some that were poor, just there because they were poor. Um, so we have to understand that, that when they got to the country uh, of, uh, of the destination here in, in America or uh, in other country, in countries like Australia, it wasn't like England. In England, uh, if you moved from one town to another, everyone knew everyone and you were the obvious not not unknown person and uh, probably arrested or at least uh, questioned uh, pretty quickly about why you were there. In the United States, no one knew anybody and uh, there was no problem and all they realized after a very short period of time is that all they had to do was change their name, walk across the street and they were a different person and they were never going to be found. Uh, so uh, likewise, so uh, subsequently many of the arrivals arrived in America and uh, ended up with a different name than they had in England or, or uh, wherever they came from. So we'll talk more about names in a, in a minute, but that, that begins to lay, this, lay the basis for how we're going to go about finding, finding these people once they, uh, finding their origins once they end up being here in, the, in America. I have to say America because uh, the uh, United States didn't begin until 1776, and we had uh, a couple of hundred years of, of history before that uh, in the American continent where people had already gotten here and, and been pretty well established. Um, so if you do not know the country of origin, then this is a reason why you would start with research in the country of arrival, and I always include in that starting with the descendants of the immigrant and uh, learning as much as you can about the children and their grandchildren and their and any other members of their family that may be may come to light uh, because that gives you a wider base of people who may have made a, a very specific reference to the the place where the ancestor came from now once again, the immigrant may have changed the name, their name at the time of the immigration, and the records may be uh, found with the uh, immigrant family sometime after the actual immigration occurred. Um, uh, 
the classic case for in my own research was after many many years of searching for the origin of a of uh, my great great grandfather who came from Ireland I found his birth record in a marriage record that that took place years after he came to America so uh, he had written down where he was from and that as far as I know and looking at the records that I've looked at for many many years that was the only place that anybody recorded where he was actually born. So you need to keep searching, uh, and it's preferable to find a record that the uh, that the immigrant ancestor makes, uh, rather than relying on secondhand uh, uh, people who could either not understand where they lived or or were kind of ignorant of how it was spelled or or what it what country it was actually in. And the last one is that family traditions and records can be misleading and or inaccurate. Um, the, the classic example from the uh, genealogist standpoint is uh, the genealogist who becomes to believe that their ancestor came from Germany because of a uh, US census record that lists the person's place of origin as Germany. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that the U.S. Census records, when they say Germany, they didn't. All they really mean is that the person spoke a language that they thought was German. Uh, they really don't have any idea of which country the person actually came from. And uh, the most common thing, and which happened even today in, a, in, in a, answering a research question this morning, was uh, someone who had down that the person was born in Germany in 1859, and I pointed out after a few minutes of showing maps that there was really no country called Germany in 1859. So we had to figure out which of the various uh, uh, kingdoms and duchies and, and other divisions there were at that time that the person came from. They came from a place, <coughs> excuse me, came from a place today called the Thuringian Estates. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, if you find out your ancestors from the Thuringian states, you probably have to go to the, uh, go to the, the uh, Wikipedia to trying to find out what, what that place really was. Okay, now, so my rule is that always start by researching the immigrants' children and grandchildren. Um, it's pretty tempting when you've looked at a pedigree chart to jump back to the empty space and start looking for the empty person. But uh, the rule it should always be to know as much as you possibly can about the children and the grandchildren. Naming patterns, uh, neighbors, relatives, families had a tendency to move over together, uh, churches, uh, schools, any anything that may have given uh, these people cause to associate with or be found with people from the same area uh, of Europe as they came from. Um, passenger lists are good uh, because they give you the names of other passengers who came with the immigrant to America. So we start by looking at the um, at the way that these uh, that the immigrant registers here in this country among his children and grandchildren uh, for hints as to where they came from in Europe. And it, it goes without saying that you need to make sure that all the information is as complete and accurate as possible when you start uh, compiling this. My one longest uh, search for the immigrant's origin was the one I just referred to as one of my great-great-grandfathers. And the reason why it became a started out as a difficult um, task was because his daughter recorded the name incorrectly. And so spending years looking for the place that did not exist until we finally found the actual name, which of course was able to be found in a matter of a few minutes on the internet. Um, we need to focus on records that, that might have recorded a place of origin. And those kinds of records include marriage records, uh, land and property records may be surprising, but it, it is possible that uh, the land and property records could contain, contain a reference to the person's um, 
place of origin. Uh, wills and probates are another place where it, they might mention that they were that they were born. Uh, people have a tendency, in older, especially in older wills, to uh, kind of give a narrative of their life, and so uh, that is another good place to look. Court records um, at a variety of times, the person may have been involved in court actions. Uh, the wills and probates, of course, are court actions. Marriage uh, could have taken place in a court. And the court records may uh, contain testimony that the person gave uh, concerning some sort of controversy in which the person testified about the place where they were born. Um, my, the same great grandfather that I referred to in the, um, that I referred to just a second ago, who came from Ireland, uh, was was arrested and and served and uh, brought to uh, under a charge of unlawful cohabitation. He was a polygamist in the early days of Utah, and uh, one of the leads that I thought would be helpful would be to find his. Uh, record in the federal district courts, which I finally did find in the Denver um, archive, National Archives branch in Denver, Colorado. Unfortunately, he did not bother to mention where he was from in the, in the court proceedings. Well, it could have been, uh, but it was a marriage record that ultimately really revealed where he was, uh, where he had originated, where he'd been born. Uh, naturalization records are extremely important, but we'll see here in a moment uh, that naturalization uh, is limited uh, to those time periods in which the naturalization uh, involved providing uh, uh, complete records of, of the origin, place of origin of the person. Um, Next point and an important issue is to research the entire family and anybody living in the same area who speak the same language. Um, people have a tendency to do what's called cluster. It's a clustering uh, concept, meaning that they uh, they live and they die and they are buried in the same areas as their family members and that family members tend to cluster around people who speak the same language. So in the larger cities, for example, in New York, you always had uh, uh, the Irish section and you had the uh, Catholic section and you had different things depending on religion and, and uh, ethnicity. And so, it was, so it's really important in genealogy to recognize that these uh, relationships may exist and uh, be able to uh, to capitalize on those to find additional people who may be from the same area, even if your own ancestors never mentioned where they were born, perhaps one of their neighbors who came with the same group uh, may list where they were born. Um, some of the U.S. Census records tell what language is spoken, and that may be a clue. Uh, in one case, I remember uh, that uh, the family assumed that the ancestor was from Germany because the, the uh, U.S. Census said that they were from Germany, but they said that the census record said that they spoke Hungarian, and uh, that obviously contradicted that they were from a German-speaking country. Now this is another rule, and that is always search for church records. You'll be surprised how many people I talk to who have been researching for years and years, and when I ask them what church did your ancestor belong to, they can't answer that question. Uh, if they don't know what church your ancestor belonged to, it's very hard to find the church records. Why is this important? Well, it's because many of the churches make a record of the parish or church of the immigrant's origin. when for example, uh, a classic example is the Catholic Church. If you moved from European Catholic parish to an American Catholic parish, uh, the priest in many cases would have to verify that you actually were uh, a Catholic. This also occurred in Presbyterians and Methodists and some of the other denominations. Uh, if you were, for example, a Presbyterian, there were two things. You could either become a member of the uh, U.S. congregation by uh, what they'd call uh, an affidavit or a, a, rec a recommend, essentially, or you could become a, a um, 
a member by challenge, and that is you had to answer a whole series of questions and be prepared to, to defend the fact that you really were a Presbyterian. Um, uh, so if the uh, if in fact the person came in because they were they had a uh, a, a transfer document from the previous uh, parish over in in the foreign country, then that's uh, going to tell you exactly where that person came from, without any difficulty at all. Well, yeah, finding them is a little bit different question, but. Um, in the in the uh, in the church record roles, what you'll find is that they have what are called enrollment, and uh, and they have a variety of names for them. But they're century uh, essentially departure roles. So they may list all the people who moved in, and then they'll list all the people who moved out. And and uh, in some cases, they tell where they came from, and they t and where they're going. Um, another good idea is to use what's called a record selection table. This particular one is in the Family Search Research Wiki, and it's the United States Record Selection Table. What it does is it says, what are you looking for? And then it gives you a list of places that you might want to go look. And then if none of those work, it gives you a list of places to go next after that. Um, this is a good good device for uh, for sparking your uh, research efforts and directing you out into an area that you may not have thought of. When I was first starting years and years ago, I uh, I remember running across one of these and I thought it was a very interesting and, and a valuable thing to have. Um, good news, uh, it will give you a lot of suggestions. The bad news is they're not exhaustive or complete. And there may be many, many more records besides the ones listed that could be valuable and assist you in your in your uh, search. This one's on the FamilySearch.org research wiki, and you'd search for United States Record Selection. Uh, this is just a caution: don't believe everything that you hear from your family. Um, there are lots of uh, myths going around. Um, uh, many times the names, uh, your ancestors' names, because they were similar to uh, the name of a famous person, becomes associated with that famous person. Uh, my family has several of those. I have a Morgan line where they, uh, where it was not uncommon that the Morgans end up being related to John Pierpont Morgan. J.P. Morgan from the bank company. Uh, I have uh, another part of my Morgan line that they uh, have a tendency to try to relate me to uh, Daniel Boone's mother, who was a Morgan. <laughs> so none of those are true, by the way. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've proved that uh, from all of my research. I shouldn't use the word prove. I've, I, I, hard, I strongly disagree with that, with those uh, connections. Um, and uh, uh, so it's a place of origin seems to be one of those things that uh, uh, is commonly passed down through families that doesn't that don't usually uh, sometimes sometimes they're correct sometimes they're not it really depends on the time depth that that occurs and it's also very very possible that you'll come come across people who are absolutely firmly unalterably convinced that they found the uh, the person in the in the um, European in the European country particularly in England or someplace and uh, and they simply cannot base that on any fact they find lots of information about a person with a similar name and similar family names in England which is not unusual but connecting that person to the person in the United States or in America uh, sometimes defies any any uh, actual proof at all. Uh, there's the the classic one. I, I I would be remiss if I didn't mention the classic uh, family tradition is that there were three brothers who came across the ocean at the same time, and one went north, and one went west, and one went south, and so these three people were tracking these people now.
not discrediting the fact that there may have actually been three brothers that came to the United States, but this is this is something you hear so commonly in families. Um, I'm sometimes I'm sitting there and somebody starts to explain to me about where they think the immigrant came from, and they start out with his three brothers story, and I go, oh well. <laughs> I know we haven't we have a long road to hoe here, folks, because not only do I have to find out where this person was born, but we also have to find convince them that there weren't three brothers that came over at the same time. But sometimes it's true. I get the one with the Indian princess also that people claim that they're related to an Indian princess out of out of all of the um probably dozens of people who have come to me with the Indian princess story. Uh, I've only had about two of them that were actually related to Native Americans. <laughs> um, here's a, here's the starting here's one of the starting points, and that is to become familiar with the research, the the immigration laws uh, wherever you are, particularly here in the United States. Research the immigration laws in effect at the time of your ancestors' arrival. Here's why you'll find that out correctly. Because the immigration laws have changed dramatically over the time. Uh, here's the common one. This is one that I always like to hear. Is uh, I'm unable to, uh, the researcher says, I cannot find the immigration records for my ancestor. And I say, well, OK, have you looked for the immigration record? Yes, I've looked for immigration records for a long time. Well, where did your, where did your ancestor come from? England. And where did they come to? Canada. I go, well, that's interesting because you can't immigrate from England to Canada. <laughs> this is essentially the same country. <laughs> and it was, it's always been that way. So, you know, obviously there are not going to be any immigration records. There may be a lot of other records, but they don't change citizenship, particularly when they, and during times in the past. Now, those laws may have changed. At different times, they may have had different requirements to move from England to, to Canada, but generally speaking, for a long many years, just like with the United just like before the United States with the English colonies in America, they didn't change countries. They only changed continents. <laughs> so they're not uh, there's no immigration involved. Uh, this is this is a very important rule. Um, one of the other great myths that we hear constantly is that my ancestor came to America and they came through um, Ellis Island. And when they came to Ellis Island, the government officials changed their name. And the answer to that one is no one had their name changed at Ellis Island. If they came and, and gave a different name, that was their personal change. It wasn't imposed on them by the government. The government simply recorded their name as they presented it at the time. Uh, many times people's names changed. I've got two examples that I think are important from Scandinavia. The first one was, uh, it has to do with my wife's family. Uh, her family name was Westman, W-E-S-S-M-A-N which does not sound at all Swedish, um, but in fact came from Sweden. And for many years, there was the belief in her family that the immigrant at the time changed his name from Benson, B-E-N-G-N-T-S-E-S-O-N, -S -S from Sweden to Westman uh, as a result of immigrating to the United States. The answer to that question came about when they found out that there were lots of Westmans in Sweden, and that if there was a name changed, it was probable that it probable that it occurred before they left um, Sweden. So that the, that particular problem is now past. Uh, they've got many year, many years of, of uh, ancestry now that they've found in Sweden. But another one was my own ancestor, whose name was a little bit more problematic, and his name was Ovesen. It's O-V-E-S-E-N, and from Denmark. And uh, his name, when he got to the United States, was ultimately he changed his name to Overson, F-O-V-E-R-S-O-N. Okay, well, so there's a couple of things that came out of that. First of all, 
the idea that everybody in the country whose name was Overson, O-V-E-R-S-O-N, was related to my ancestor because he uh, assumed that name when he came here, so everybody should have been related to him. Well, the answer is there are Oversons, O-V-E-R-S-O-N-S, who are not related to us all over the country. And so what happened there? Well, doing a little bit more research, we find that he changed his name to Oveson, O-V-E-S-O-N, which seems to counter to the common way of spelling in Denmark with an S-E-N, before he left Denmark. And the reason was that back in the 1850s in Denmark, the government, because of military conscription reasons and other reasons, was trying to stop the 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 practice of patronymics, that is having the father, the son, or the children take the, the, the father's first name as a surname. So Ovi Ovison was the son of Ovi, who may have been Ovi Jensen, the son of Jens, and so forth. Um, so basically his name had been changed. Now the O-E-R part of it, Overson, uh, the story finally after, we, after I looked into it, he did that, but he didn't do that. It was the way that they were hearing his name. When he spoke his name, people would automatically put an R in there. Instead of Oveson, they heard Overson with an R. And so every time it would write down, finally he just said, I guess I'm going to change my name to Overson because everybody's going to write it down anyway. Uh, that's essentially why he changed his name. Neither of those occurred... Uh, as a direct result of his immigration, but rather than just simply naming it, uh, people's names change over time, uh, often because they're difficult to pronounce or because people spell them uh, differently. If that were the case, by the way, my last name would be Turner instead of Tanner because about 25% of the people, when I say my name, immediately think my name is Turner instead of Tanner. That's just the way it comes out. Okay, so you could have military mandated name changes in Europe uh, as a result of the changing of patronymics. You could have an, a desire on the part of the immigrant to Americanize his na the name. Uh, instead of uh, Stanislavski, they might want to change their name to Jones <laughs> just to make their life a little easier, uh, which of course uh, makes it different. And then uh, Refugees or political reasons, they may simply want to come here uh, and disappear. Uh, indentured servants, as I already mentioned, they may want to change their name simply to disappear when they got here. And those who were transported, meaning that they were criminals or judged criminals in Europe uh, and sent overseas uh, for uh, uh, simply for instead of sending them to prison. It's cheaper to send them, by the way, on a, put them on a boat and send them to America than it was to uh, um, to leave to maintain them in England. And that, in a sense, to it. And of course, we have a huge number of people who came to America as slaves, and they their names uh, in the uh, that they had in in uh, the countries of their origin were definitely changed dramatically from what they were when they before they came here. Um, this is the this the basic rule is to always research the community. We're talking about people who come who do not come here in a vacuum. They generally come here as a result of some social economic conditions in the in the country of origin or political reasons. So uh, one of the most famous groups of people who came to America as a result of uh, conditions in the in the country of origin were the Irish who came here because of the famine uh, called the potato famine that occurred in the 1850s. Now that's interesting but what happened if your ancestors showed up in America in the 1830s from Ira, Ireland? Well if you go back into the history of Ireland you'll find out that uh, starvation was not new uh, lack of uh, political uh, stability was not new. And there were a lot of other uh, local factors in Ireland that made it very attractive to pack up and leave and come to America. Uh, 
Uh, so researching the entire community will always be helpful. Always look for your ancestors' relatives and friends in the same area. This is called cluster genealogy. Very, very powerful way of looking at, um, at populations to uh, tease out, in a sense, or, or, or isolate your ancestors from all the other people who may have come to America um, with the same or similar names. Now we're going to change um, gears here a little bit and go to uh, the ports of entry. Where do these people come into the United States? Where do we start this process of looking for? Well, it's not very helpful if they came by ship because they could come in any place you could land a ship. Um, I can't even pronounce the place in Maine where my my uh, Irish family came. I think it's I'm not even going to try because I'm afraid I'll uh, make somebody think where did I don't come from Maine by the way, so I have no idea how these places are pronounced. But there's that's where they landed in Maine. And if you look at the United States map, you'll see we have uh, many thousands of miles of coastline, and that's where they could have landed. Um, it's not very helpful. So you. Uh, but we do understand that uh, even if they came by ship, they likely came to one of the larger ports of entry, a place where they were, were uh, uh, accustomed to coming, where they got uh, some kind of passage from uh, where they left in Europe, whether it was Liverpool or Hamburg or wherever else they left from in Europe. So what were the major ports? Well, first of all, we know there were two in New York that were extremely important, where millions and millions of, of immigrants entered the country. The first one was Castle Garden, which is at the tip of Manhattan, now called uh, the tip of Manhattan Park. No, it's where it's Battery Park. And it's right there where the uh, uh, Trade Center collapsed and all that. So anyway, Castle Garden, 1855 to 1890, was the port of, main port of entry into the uh, United States. And the second one after that, beginning in 1892, was Ellis Island, off, right off the point of Manhattan and next to the, to the uh, Statue of Liberty Island, to Liberty Island. And that was in, in uh, operation until 1954. Uh, we're going through some uh, uh, time periods, we've gone through some uh, anniversaries of these uh, of the existence of Ellis Island. They actually have a statue on Ellis Island and a couple of other places of the first uh, European immigrant girl who came, who was the first person uh, that was uh, uh, processed through Ellis Island. Uh, Baltimore was a big place to come, a uh, big seaport up Chesapeake Bay to Baltimore. And uh, a lot of people came through the Baltimore port. Uh, Philadelphia, likewise, was a uh, great place to come to the United States. And a lot of people came through Philadelphia. Uh, New Orleans at the mouth of the Mississippi River was a, um, an entry point for many of the, of the immigrants. Uh, uh, from my own uh, family history, going back, uh, uh, the immigrants who came through uh, to the uh, uh, who joined the, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormons uh, and came up the Mississippi River to uh, the Mormon settlements in Illinois, uh, generally came in through New Orleans. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, for a lot of uh, immigrants from the Pacific uh, nations and from Asia, uh, has been a major point as, as well as San Francisco. So. Uh, there are, in fact, uh, uh, online references listing the uh, the people who came in through these all of these major um, places. The, the biggest ones that I've mentioned already, I believe, is Ancestry.com that has passenger lists and immigration and arrival records for all these. Oh, there we go. Uh, Next, we're going to talk about border crossings. Obviously, we have borders with Mexico and Canada. And uh, there was a time when people could simply walk into the country. 
they're still walking into the country legally or illegally, but we won't get into the illegal part of it. Uh, but there, uh, uh, this is the border crossings incidents. And uh, it seems uh, kind of uh, simplistic, but border crossings require defined borders. And uh, they, it took a long time to get defined borders with any of these, uh, of these two countries. Uh, with the two major borders, first of all, we have the Mexican border, which runs along Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. And then we have the uh, Canadian border, which is uh, uh, along all of the northern uh, tier states of the United States. And those two borders, for example, uh, during colonial times, there were no controls over entry or exit, period. Nobody cared if you showed up in America. All you have to do is get off the ship, unpack your, your belongings, and start trying to find a job or start trying to find some land to have for a farm or whatever you wanted to do. Uh, that was why we considered this to be the country of great opportunity, because people could leave Europe and come here and start a new life uh, without any particular difficulty or, or uh, bureaucratic issues. Uh, this map is called the Territorial Acquisitions Map from 1783, right after the, the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, until 1853, when they finally acquired the last portion of the what we call the continental United States. Um, and if you were to uh, study this carefully, I realize that on the slide it's difficult to see the exact ones. Essentially what you have is the pink part or the pink or rose colored part of it on the east is what uh, was originally part of the colonies that was uh, obtained uh, from England primarily, Great Britain, uh, when uh, during the, the time of the Revolutionary War. So when they uh, began the, the country, now all of those states, obviously, that are in that area were not there. And most of the western boundaries were sort of theoretical uh, until many years after they began the survey process. The next great acquisition, of course, was the Louisiana Purchase. And then we had the Florida and Texas and Mexican session. We also uh, negotiated a defined boundary uh, and any claims that the British had to Oregon. And the last one was a little piece of land that was purchased from Mexico called the Gadsden Purchase. Um, most of these uh, happened as a result of wars. Of course, we had the Revolutionary War. But the Louisiana was actually a purchase. But the Texas and Mexican uh, ac uh, accessions were done uh, by uh, because we fought a war with Spain and Mexico. Uh, so uh, there were quite a, uh, uh, this, this is how we finally obtained the outline of what we have. Now, even though we had generally these, piece, these properties, you understand that the northern southern borders were very, very ill-defined until much later. So this is an example with the US-Canadian border. The first one was the treaty that gave us uh, a line between the United States and Canada was the Treaty of Paris in 1783, and then the Jay Treaty in 94, and the London Convention in 1818, and the Ashburton Treaty in 1842, and the Oregon Treaty in 1846, and the Northwest Boundary Survey in 1857-61, and the Alaska Boundary Dispute in 1903. Okay, so those are all the different treaties and negotiations that went into uh, to, to defining that U.S.-Canadian border. And if you caught that when it flew by your eyes, uh, the last one was only in 1903 that we actually decided where our border was with Canada. Now, there are still places under dispute. And if you've been across the Canadian border recently, you realize that it's not really a line, it's more of an area. <laughs> and, and by the way, with telephone companies, it's uh, really indistinct <laughs> as to where that border is. If you're uh, traveling across the, uh, an international border and you have a cell phone, you'd better be careful with about your international service because uh, they may pick up international as much as 50 miles into the United States or as much as 10 or 15 or 20 miles into Canada. So.
Okay, so finally in 1925, we have what's called the International Boundary Commission, and that settled any disputes, but not exactly defined, not always defined exactly where the border was. Now, as far as crossing the border is concerned, it, this has pretty well been established. So if you're driving north to Canada, you, you really do have a defined spot at which you cross the border. Uh, so there have to be border crossing records. Well, there are, but the first immigration law, by the way, was not passed until 1882. Think about that for a minute. All the problems we seem to be tied into in the United States today over immigration, and we didn't even have an immigration law until about 100 years ago. <laughs> okay, so we were letting anybody come in for uh, for 300 years, and then finally all of a sudden we decided that we'd had enough and started passing immigration laws. The first immigration laws were the Chinese Exclusion Acts that began in 1882, and quite frankly, until 1900s, the only people that they tried to keep out of the United States were Asians. So uh, that's just the way that it was. Uh, so the first border arrival records with Canada showing whoever crossed the border from Canada began in 1895. From a genealogical standpoint, that's kind of a blink in the past. So you really, you really, unless you're just barely starting out trying to determine your great, your grandparents or your great grandparents, uh, border rec crossings are probably not going to be helpful to you, except we have millions of people in the United States today whose parents and grandparents were born in foreign countries. So uh, this is a place for you to get started with those records. And of course, border arrival records were not fully established as required until 1908. So this is where you get that. Now, where do you get border crossing records? Border crossing records are found, I'm, I have to go back to Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org uh, have uh, huge collections of border crossing records. National Archives is really the ultimate place. The United States National Archives is, usually, is the ultimate place to find the border crossing records if they've been preserved. Okay, so this one tells you another interesting situation because uh, it brings it even closer to the present. Before approximately 1930, no count was made of residents of Canada, Newfoundland, or Mexico who had lived in those countries for a year or more if they planned to enter the United States for less than six months. So you just walk across the border until 1930 all they had to have done was lived in Mexico for a year and then they could come into the United States without any kind of record of coming across the border. Okay, where do we get these records? The National Archives, which I mentioned, which is archives with an S, gov, dot gov. Uh, Ancestry.com, that's for passenger lists and border crossings. Family Search for passenger lists and border crossings and Family Search Wiki for information on where other records such as this would be located on FamilySearch.org, the research wiki. Castle Garden, CastleGarden.org is uh, a website that uh, gives you access to the lists of immigrants who came through the Castle Garden. And Ellis Island is called Liberty Ellis foundation.org and that has the list of the immigrants who came through Ellis Island. Um, these lists are pretty exhaustive and complete. Um, they're a good place to start because they, they cover so much ground. Uh, unless your ancestors like some of mine came to America in the 1600s when it's a little bit more difficult to figure out which of all of the people with the same name were the one that actually showed up here. And that concludes our webinar for today on immigration. And we'll look and see if anybody has. Might mention up here on the corner where it says, uh, James Tanner, find your whatever, and then trails off. That is a file, uh, that's a link on the, uh, on the webinar to downloading a copy of the handouts. Um, you can also go to the BYU Family History Library website
on the schedule page and uh, where we're making, uh, where the list of completed webinars is contained. And that will also have links to the handout. Any other questions coming up? All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for watching today.